Welcome again, grade 11 students. We are still discussing chapter 2, DNA, genetic information and the cell cycle. However, we will be starting with the most important lesson of all, activity 3, the structure and chemical composition of DNA. At the end of this video, you will be able to describe the DNA molecule, deduce the results of Chargaff's rule concerning the DNA structure, recognize that the sequence of nucleotides determines the specificity of the DNA. Make sure to prepare your extra worksheet and a pencil case. Previously, we've learned about this cell that contains chromosomes, where if we looked closely into each chromosome, we will find DNA. Let's ask some students what do they know about this DNA. DNA is a long molecule that contains our unique genetic code. DNA identifies the identity of an individual and it consists of body cells and germ cells. DNA is found in all our cells and is made up of atoms. DNA is a molecule that carries genetic materials that are responsible for development, functioning and growth. Now, what about you? What do you think is DNA? And what are the components of a DNA molecule? Let's start the lesson to answer these questions. In our first step, we must locate DNA in the cell. And here comes Robert Folgen, who made a staining technique named Folgen stain that stained or colored DNA in red, as you can see here. In this way, Folgen found that DNA is located in the nucleus of a cell. Now, let me share some interesting information with you. Did you know that one DNA molecule is 2 meters long? So, that if you stretch all the DNA molecules found in your body, they will be as twice as our galaxy's length. This is quite long. How is this possible? How do 2 meters of DNA fit in a 6 micrometer cell? Well, the solution is in one protein molecule. What is this molecule? Watch the following video in order to find how DNA is packaged inside the cell. In this animation, we'll see the remarkable way our DNA is tightly packed up so that six feet of this long molecule fits into the microscopic nucleus of every cell. The process starts when DNA is wrapped around special protein molecules called histones. The combined loop of DNA and protein is called a nucleosome. Next, the nucleosomes are packaged into a thread. The end result is a fiber known as chromatin. This fiber is then looped and coiled yet again. Leading finally to the familiar shapes known as chromosomes, which can be seen in the nucleus of dividing cells. Chromosomes are not always present. They form around the time cells divide when the two copies of the cell's DNA need to be separated. So how does 2 meters of DNA become a shorter chromosome? Let's explain what you've seen in the video. Starting from a DNA molecule, according to what you've seen, this thread, long thread of DNA is being wrapped or coiled around a protein called histone protein, forming what we call a nucleosome. So nucleosome is a histone protein plus DNA molecule that is wrapped or coiled around those proteins. In the next step, those nucleosomes are being packed one on the other, forming what we call a chromatin. And of course, you've heard about this chromatin previously. Then what's happening is that this chromatin is being wrapped and wrapped again in order to form the chromosome. Let me remind you, this chromatin is found during interphase, while this chromosome is found during mitosis or cell division. So what's happening for the chromatin to become a chromosome? We call it condensation. 
In short, this 2 meters of DNA will become 0.2 micrometer chromosome with the help of a protein called histone protein. It's just like packing a long thread of wool into a shorter scarf. Now let's start with our second objective by describing the components of the DNA molecule. What is exactly inside this DNA? Looking at this DNA molecule, how can you describe its structure? Well, you can see that this DNA is made up of two strands, one in purple here and the other one in yellow. And those two strands have a helix shape. So we can say here that this DNA molecule is a double helix made up of two strands. Now let's unwind this DNA molecule and straighten the two strands in order to find what's the component of each strand. Looking carefully into each strand, you can find that there's some kind of repetition here. What is the molecule that is being repeated? This structure here is being repeated once, twice, and several times. What do we call a molecule that has several repeating units? Let me remind you here about a molecule called a polymer. The polymer is made up of several smaller monomers. So looking again at this DNA molecule, we can say that it's a polymer made up of small monomers where we call each monomer of these a nucleotide. What is a nucleotide made up of? The nucleotide is made up of smaller three structures, which are the phosphoric acid, the deoxyribose sugar, and a nitrogenous base. Now again, we need to find the types of those nitrogenous bases. Looking at this DNA molecule, how many types of nitrogenous bases can you find? We can find A that refers to adenine, G that refers to guanine, T that refers to thymine, and C that refers to cytosine. So let's make a kind of a map to memorize what we've said. A DNA molecule is a polymer made up of monomers called nucleotides. Each nucleotide is made up of phosphoric acid, nitrogenous base, and deoxyribose sugar. And we have four different types of nitrogenous bases. A refers to adenine, T thymine, G guanine, and C cytosine. And this is our complex DNA molecule. D refers to deoxyribo and to nucleic or the nucleus, A to acid. So DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. For our last question concerning the structure of DNA, we said that those two helices makes one double helix. So how does the first helix and the second helix combine in order to form one double helix? The answer lies in those bonds between the two DNA strands as you can see here. So DNA is stabilized by the hydrogen bonds between the nitrogenous bases in the two strands as you can see where we have two types of those bonds. A always pairs with T by two hydrogen bonds and C always pairs with G by three hydrogen bonds. Continuing up from here, looking at this DNA strand, what can you notice concerning those base pairs? Look carefully at each base pair in the two strands. By looking at each base, you can find that when we have adenine, we have thymine in the opposite strand. So adenine always pairs with thymine. And where you have guanine, we have cytosine in the opposite strand. So we can say that guanine always pairs with cytosine. Now this rule is discovered by Chargaff. That's why it's called Chargaff's rule, where A should be equal to T and G should be equal to C. How is that? Look at those two strands and start counting each nucleotide in the first strand and in the opposite strand. Is the rule applied here? Let's see. In the first strand, you have two thymine nucleotides, so that in the second strand, you have two adenine molecules. Same goes for the adenine in the first strand. Two adenine, then we have two thymine in the opposite strand. One guanine will fit with one cytosine. And finally, if you have three cytosine, you will have three guanine. The rule is simple. G must be equal to C and A must be equal to T. Now let's have some kind of calculation. If a DNA molecule has 180 base pairs and 20% adenine, how many cytosine nucleotides are present in this molecule of DNA? Pause the video and remember the rule carefully and try to find the cytosine nucleotides.
Well, if we said that 20% adenine are found in this DNA molecule, then also 20% of thymine are present, since A should be equal to T. Now, the whole DNA molecule is 100%, and the percent of A and T will be 40, 20 plus 20 is 40%. Then what's left for the percentage of CG nucleotides is 60%. And again, Chargaff rule says that the percentage of C should be G. And if CG is 60, then each one of them will be 30%. Hence, it contains 54 cytosine nucleotides, since 30% of 180 base refers to 54 cytosine nucleotides. Up to our final objective concerning the specificity of a DNA. Well, you know by now that all human karyotype is similar. They all have 23 pairs of chromosomes. However, each human is so much different from the other. Why is that and how is that possible? Well, if we studied one type of chromosome in two individuals and then we looked at the sequence of the nucleotide in each one, we can find that they are similar. However, a change in only one nucleotide or in only one base will make those two individuals very different. So the sequence of nucleotides determines the specificity of DNA. We are different not because we have different chromosomes, it's because we have different sequence of these nucleotides. And that's how DNA makes us. In this video, you've learned that DNA is packed inside the nucleus with the help of histone protein and that this chromosome is a condensed form of chromatin. You've also learned that this DNA is a double helix made up of different nucleotides. Each nucleotide is made up of phosphoric acid, deoxyribose sugar, and one of four nitrogenous bases, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, where according to Chargaff, guanine always pairs with cytosine by three hydrogen bonds, and T always pairs with A by two hydrogen bonds, which makes the two strands complementary. Finally, this sequence of nucleotides determines the specificity of the DNA and thus the individual. As an assignment, please make sure to memorize the summary sheet and to solve the extra sheet. This video is prepared and recorded by teacher Zahra Shiri and supervised by teacher Ehsan Hash Hassan. Thank you for your time.